What do blondes and Hummers have in common? They're both going to cost you a lot of money. That's this week on Motoring 2002. TSN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! You know, with the automotive world completely saturated with sport utilities, you need a program to tell one from the other, but not with this baby. Of course, this is the Hummer, a vehicle that has played a major role in military conflicts around the world since about the mid-70s. And then along came Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he made it available to civilians, albeit with fat wallets. Well, this week we're going to check out the heritage of this vehicle. We're also going to look at its future now that General Motors has bought the brand. And we're going to begin by going back to an earlier motoring episode when we took a convoy to the birthplace of one of the most unique vehicles on this planet. The Hummer is built by A.M. General Corporation in South Bend, Indiana. A.M. General is a descendant of Willys Overland Motors, which first created the Jeep, North America's first four-wheel drive truck. Back in 1979, A.M. General won the military contract to build a vehicle which would replace five different vehicles for the military, and that included the Jeep. The Humvee went into production in 1985 and nearly 150,000 have been built. Uh, Desert Storm was a great proving ground for the truck. The military had had it for several years prior to Desert Storm. Uh, there were over 19,000 units uh, in the Gulf, Gulf War, uh, and it, they performed very, very well. Uh, they had a readiness rate of over 90, 95%, which was the highest in the military's history. Following the war, the Humvee showed up at the Detroit Auto Show as the Hummer. Arnold Schwarzenegger had a lot to do with uh, getting us involved. He actually chased down a convoy of military trucks one time to uh, find out who made the thing. Uh, but uh, we, we started in 1992 selling uh, a handful of trucks uh, direct before we set, while we were setting up a dealer body. And then 1993 we launched our dealer's trucks and the dealer body. There's a lot of break. It's okay. Good. Keep coming. We have three areas to the course, from novice to advanced, and your driver is really the one that's challenged. Okay, easy, easy, come forward. The vehicle is amazing, and it just about drives the trail in spite of you. So it really, it depends on the driver finesse, and the trails get very challenging. We get at some pretty extreme angles, and the idea is not to be alarmed or to panic, but to use what you've been taught and drive through it. Well, I'm from Stouffville, Ontario. Um, I enjoy this vehicle because I can drive it just about anywhere. That's the big attraction. You just came home with it one day and said, this is my new vehicle. Can you understand the popularity? Is it, is it a guy thing? Is it a macho thing? Is it a... It's definitely a guy thing. Midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Are you allowed to have one too? And what would you buy? What would I buy? Um, I drive a Suburban. No, it's not a guy thing. No? no, I like to do this. And when I, wa I was up there, I want to, do, uh, to go down. I was nervous, but uh, I want to do that. It's a good thrill. <laughs> the truck isn't really for everybody. And, uh, that's not a snobbish answer, but uh, it, it doesn't, it's not for the, the average person. It's, it's a truck that if you truly want to go off-road in some uh, difficult terrain, this is the right truck for you. When General Motors bought the rights to the Hummer brand, we bought it uh, with the sole intent of being the, if you will, the civilian or the uh, retail side of that business, and uh, that's why we'll distribute and sell the Hummers through our six uh, 
Fisher and General Motors dealers across the country. The Hummer. The Hummer. The Hummer. Oh, oh my God. The Acura Integra was considered by many to be a picture-perfect sports car. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at its replacement, a vehicle that's not only new in its development, but also carries a new name, and that's RSX. As a replacement for a competent car, it was important the RSX be better in all key areas, the suspension being an important one. Riding on a strong platform with struts up front and double wishbones in back, the RSX brings anti-roll bars and a surprisingly balanced feel for a front-wheel drive car. Through the pylons, the RSX stayed flatter than gravy on a plate, meaning body roll is a non-issue and understeer, well it only encroaches as you start to push the limits. The steering also helps enormously as it communicates what's happening at the wheels with great precision. The same holds true when out on the open road as you carve your way through your favourite corners. However, there is a penalty for this level of agility, and that's a somewhat firm ride, especially on the rutted roads that are so common in this country. While you don't need to increase the limits of your dental plan, it becomes very obvious when the road deteriorates. A part of the allure of the RSX is the fact that it comes very well endowed when it arrives in your driveway. The reason, it comes with 160 horsepower in the base model. If you really feel the need for speed though, take the Type S. It brings 200 horsepower even, and that is a lot for a naturally aspirated engine. The secret? Well, it lies in something Honda calls iVTEC. <laughs> iVTEC is the latest version of Honda's highly respected variable valve timing and lift electronic control. As well as switching to a higher cam profile above about 3500 RPM, it also alters the cam timing. Combined, these two facets bring a high level of horsepower, although a torque figure of 141 pounds-feet at 4000 is on the low side. It also mandates a trip well up the rev range to access the sweetness, which brings a little bit of engine noise. That said, it's all very easy to overlook as this car delivers a good turn of speed when pressed. The automatic transmission also helps as it brings five speeds in a manumatic mode. The latter allows you to pick the gear you want through a fast corner simply by nudging the lever forward or back. It really does enhance a very pleasurable drive. Slip behind the wheel of the RSX and well aside from the very austere feel which is predominantly because of the wash of black that's only broken up by this insert and a very nice set of gauges. That aside, this vehicle was obviously designed for the driver. The seats hug you and keep you planted, the steering wheel's got a very nice chunky feel and well there's a dead pedal to keep you planted. As for the controls, well they're all very logically placed with the exception of two. The exceptions are the cruise on-off switch. It should be over here with the rest of the functions and the sunroof switch, well, it should be up on the roof. Stopping power comes from a good anti-lock system and discs at all four corners. The advantage is that unlike many Hondas, the RSX's system does not kick in just because the sky clouds over. Rather, it waits until intervention is actually needed. You know, if you buy an RSX, you really must consider this vehicle a 2 plus 2. First of all, getting into the back seat, well, let's just say you won't retain very much dignity climbing back here. The biggest problem, though, I think it becomes fairly obvious that headroom is very much at a premium. On the safety front, the RSX gets the goods. There are front and side airbags, as well as pretensioners for the front seat belts. Where the design differs from many in this segment is that the airbag system monitors the size and position of the passenger. If too small or deemed to be out of place, the side airbag is deactivated which prevents unnecessary injury. You know, this RSX is a wonderful tool, quite capable of brightening even 
a rather dank day like this. It's comfortable, at least if you're only carrying two people on a regular basis. It handles like the Dickens and it's got plenty of power. Perhaps the only thing, this thing develops all its power just as you're thinking about upshifting. In short, you've got to learn to be cozy with the red light. I might have tip of the week concerns the warm-up period for your vehicle. Now, if you've ever driven a vehicle with a coolant temp gauge, you've probably noticed it takes four to eight minutes to completely get that gauge up to operating temperature in the winter time. How long it takes will depend on variables such as how big the cooling system is. A small car warms up much more quickly than a pickup or sport utility with a V8 engine. And also, it depends greatly on what the ambient temperature is when you first start that vehicle. But in most cases, you'll find that one to two minutes of idling is all that's required to drive the vehicle away safely without stumbling or stalling. But don't waste that time. Make sure that during that one to two minutes, you solidly apply the emergency brake and then do a circle check of your vehicle. Have a quick look at the tires to make sure you're not driving away in a flat and clear all the windows of any snow or frost, clear your taillights, etc. Then get in the vehicle and drive away. Now there may be conditions that dictate a longer warm-up period. For example, if you can't get those windows to clear properly without a bit of heat coming out of the defroster, you may have to wait an extra couple of minutes till that takes place. And in some cases, if you're driving away during freezing rain, you've got to wait until the idle completely settles down before you put it into gear. That's your Midas tip of the week. For the 2000 model year, we introduced a trim level of Sentra called the SE. But we also had plans to introduce this new trim level that you're driving today, the SER. AM General is uh, the manufacturer of Hummer and uh, they still look after the military side. So if you happen to be you know, the US government or the Canadian government and you want to fleet of military vehicles, then AM General is the one to see. Uh, when when uh, General Motors bought the rights uh, to the Hummer brand, we bought it uh, with the sole intent of being the, if you will, the civilian or the uh, retail side of, the, uh, of that business. And, uh, and so we, that's why we'll distribute um, and sell the Hummers through our six uh, existing General Motors dealers across the country. The Hummer is really um, a legendary vehicle that started um, back in the 1960s and General Motors since 1999 has become involved with Hummer and we're excited to launch the all new H2 and Hummer is really the most serious off-road 4x4 in the world and the second version called the H2 which is here today is really the second version of serious off-roading but can also be used in an urban setting. Yes, it's big, and, and every uh, Hummer is not for everybody. It's for somebody who wants to be different and, uh, and uh, likely wants to be noticed. Um, and uh, if people want that, then the Hummer is a great unit for them. Almost everybody knows what a Hummer is. I mean, it's a, it's a great vehicle. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's Hummer and Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, the two go hand in hand. It's, it's big, it's rugged. It's, it's kind of my size of, size of vehicle. And, and, and so it's brought a whole bunch of interest uh, back to General Motors. And what we hope to do with H2 is to make Hummer uh, a, just a little bit more affordable. So instead of in something in the 150 plus range, uh, we're going to have something that's in the, I'm going to say, the full size luxury sport utility range. And that's what we're really trying to accomplish is bring a little more uh, volume to the brand, bring it to a wide, wider range of people than Hummer. And, uh, and, and we expect it to do great things here in Canada. Now our Hummer H1 comes equipped with a 6.5 liter V8 turbo diesel pumping out 195 horses and 430 pounds feet of torque. Now it also comes in the gasoline variations including an 8.1 V8 pumping out 340 horses, 455 pounds feet of torque. Now I know even our Bill Gardner in the Quaker State Garage has got to be impressed with those numbers. How about it Bill? 
Well, Brad, that's a lot of power, you know, but that Hummer's pretty heavy too, so it's not going to feel like any ball of fire even with that kind of horsepower. And you know the price? For 165 grand less, I could get myself a beautiful 650 Honda liquid-cooled dirt bike, and I could crash around off-road and not worry about putting a few dings in it. Boy, I tell you, that's a lot of money for an off-road vehicle. Anyhow, there's one advertiser, I can't think of who they are, but their slogan is, power is nothing without control. And when we talk about control, steering control in a vehicle is of the utmost importance. And the part I want to show you this week on motoring is called the tie rod end. Most vehicles have at least four of them in the front end. We're going to turn the steering on this Grand Prix. My assistant's sitting inside and he's going to straighten out the steering wheel. And I'll take off the front wheel so that we can see the steering linkage a little bit better. Now, most vehicles have at least four tie rod ends in the front suspension. Some vehicles even have a couple in the rear suspension. Now, as we turn the steering linkage, you can see this outer tie rod end becoming more and more visible. That's the outer tie rod end right there. Goes up and threads onto the inner tie rod, and there's a lock nut here. This is where we, we set the toe when we're adjusting wheel alignment. Down here, there's a castle nut that locks the ball stud into the steering knuckle and a cotter pin to prevent the castle nut from backing off. This one happens to have a grease fitting. It was replaced. The original tie rod ends on this vehicle were non-greasable. The replacement ones have a fitting. That's something you want to watch for on a front-wheel drive car. Most front-wheel drive cars, light-duty cars, don't have grease fittings unless they've been replaced. You can see a little bit of grease that's oozed out of this joint, too, over the years as it was being greased. Now, here's a, a tie rod end that we replaced the other day. And it's a ball and socket type joint. When the steering uh, wheel is being turned, the ball stud rotates in this fashion right here. And as the steering, uh, as the suspension goes up and down, this action here takes place at the tie rod as well as the turning action. So there's quite a bit of motion there. And there's the boot that protects it. And you can see this one has no grease fitting. This is an original style tie rod in. Here's an outer tie rod that we had to replace the other day off a Quest minivan. And you can see how worn it is and how rusty it is inside. And the ball stud is no longer captured in the socket down here. As soon as we cut the grease boot around here, the two just separated, just completely fell apart. The only thing holding it together was that grease boot. I road tested the thing before, and as you did a gradual right turn and then came back to the left to turn the other way, the thing did a real stagger step. It actually jumped across the lane about half the vehicle width every time you did that. It was kind of scary. But in many cases, we have vehicles coming in with loose or worn tie rod ends that exhibit no, no symptoms at all. So it's important that these things get checked on a regular basis. Probably once a year is not a bad idea. Now, on some vehicles, the tie rod ends have grease fittings. This particular vehicle has had its outer tie rod ends replaced, and it's got a grease fitting there. So it's important that at least uh, once every three to four months, you get a little bit of grease going through that, that tie rod end. It flushes the dirt and water out of it and provides a better seal and provides it with lubrication. Now, in this particular car, I had to replace the inner tie rod end, one of the inner tie rod ends, a few months ago. And the symptom that I had on this front wheel drive car, and this is common to a lot of front wheel drive cars, if you have a loose inner tie rod end, you'll get vibration at high speed that seems just like a wheel that's out of balance put brand new tires on the vehicle and balance the wheels, you've still got a vibration. You might want to be looking at the inner tie rod ends. And one interesting thing about inner tie rod ends, when the weight is on the tires of the vehicle, they're kind of in line like this, and in many cases they've got looseness or play. That was the case with this vehicle. When you jack it up on the hoist and the suspension hangs down, it kind of goes down like this, and it actually tightens itself up, so it seems like there isn't a problem. So the, the, the way to check these things is with the weight on the tires. It means that uh, you've got to check it with the vehicle on the ground or have it on a, on a, the, a type of a hoist where the, where the tires are on ramps. In other words, loaded, the suspension is in, it, in its normal working height. That's when you're going to see the looseness or play in these tie rod ends. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002. Regular viewers know I'm no fan of sport utility vehicles. They're not sporty, they're not utilitarian, they're too heavy, they use too much fuel, they're so big the rest of us can't see where we're going on the highway, they tip over too easily, and the people that drive them, well they get this false sense of security, and they drive these things around as if they had brakes. But the worst thing is this image 
that these things attempt to portray for their owners. I mean, you never see them out here in the countryside. They're only seen in, in shopping malls and downtown and taking the kids to school. I mean, you need a 4x4 truck to do this. But the worst thing, have you seen this most recent TV ad? I won't tell you the name of the car company because I have to deal with these people. But it shows a dad taking his family out for a drive in the woods. He's outside the vehicle. He's got a machete and he's chopping down the trees and the branches. His wife asks him, darling, what are you doing? He says, I don't want to scratch the paint. I don't want to scratch the paint. This is a real macho, tough, off-road and frontier kind of guy. He doesn't want to scratch the paint. But wait, it gets worse. Have you seen the brush guards some of these people put on these things? Huge tubular contraptions? What's that about? So they don't scratch their chrome bumpers? Come on, people. Now, in Australia, they call those things rhubars. Exactly how many kangaroos do we have in Canada that that's a problem? You're more likely to impale some pedestrian on that thing. Maybe that's the point. You get the pedestrian home in better shape so you can mount them on your rec room wall as a trophy. Now, if you want to have even more fun with the lemmings who drive sport utility vehicles, there's a website you should check out after the show. It's poser.4x4.org. That's no www, just P-O-S-E-U-R dot 4x4.org. You'll love it. And when you're done with that, go buy a car. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, although the Hummer has been around in civilian life for over nine years, believe me, it still attracts plenty of attention and we get lots of comments. The one I hear most is from people who get in the vehicle for the first time and they react like, only four seats? But on the positive side, if you ever find yourself in a tight situation, you're stuck, a tow truck can't get to you, or you're just stuck in a traffic jam, there is an answer. You see, this Hummer, like its military brother, comes equipped with four lifting hooks. So you simply pick up the cell phone and phone the helicopter. They hook up and you're out of there. And believe me, if you can afford the Hummer, you can afford the chopper. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. What you're looking at is a 2002 Firebird Firehawk, um, 345 horsepower, the highest horsepower rating for Firebird or Camaro in its history. And uh, it goes away with a big bang uh, after the 2002 model year. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils. Formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas. Keep a good thing going. Go Midas!